you don't have that honeymoon period for very long. Yeah. Maybe 100 days, and you have to execute and prove that you deserve to win that election by fulfilling the promises to the American people. In the eyes of many in the world, this every four-year ceremony we accept as normal is nothing less than a miracle. In America, we understand that a nation is only living as long as it is striving. Only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. Whether we go forward together with courage or turn back to policies that weakened our economy, diminished our leadership in the world, America's future will be in your hands. Welcome to our Project 2025 Transition Project and our training session today. Uh, why your service matters, how presidential appointees at all levels can impact policy. I'm Derek Morgan, Executive Vice President at the Heritage Foundation, and I'm joined today by Roger Severino, Vice President for Domestic Policy, and Aaron Walsh, who's our Senior Fellow in International Affairs at the Asian Studies Center. We're going to be talking today about why it's important to be aligned in an administration, why you should serve, and the impact that you can have. And so with that, I think we'll get started right away with introductions and where we served in administrations. All three of us served uh, different presidents, some of us multiple presidents. Uh, we'll get to that. I served for four years for Vice President Dick Cheney as his staff secretary and special counsel and assistant to the vice president. It was a, an excellent experience, and I'm sure we'll get into that a little later. But Roger, why don't we start with you, and where did you serve? I was in the Trump administration as director of the Office for Civil Rights at Health and Human Services, HHS. And before that, I was a trial attorney at the U.S. Department of Justice as a career. So I was able to see both sides on the political and the career side. Excellent. And Erin, tell us, where did you serve? Well, I started at the age of 18, so I served uh, four presidents, uh, starting with Ronald Reagan. I was, when I was in college, I was at the Office of um, correspondence and then went on to political affairs, then went over to uh, the Office of Protocol and served at mm -hmm. Blair House, uh, Department of Energy, and then um, in uh, the Bush 1, 41, I served um, up the U.S. mission to the U.N. for five years. Mm -hmm. And then in 43, I came back and was at the State Department in Near Eastern Affairs Bureau. And then during the Trump administration, I was at uh, the White House. Mm -hmm. And then over to as, as assistant secretary at Department of Commerce, and then came back to the uh, White House at the National Security Council. That's fantastic. Well, we're going to be the beneficiaries of, of all of our experiences here as we talk about it. I want to start with, uh, Roger, I'll start with you on motivation. What was it that encouraged you to make that step to kind of put your hat in the ring to try to serve the President of the United States? Well, the opportunity to impact policy at a wholesale level. When I was an attorney at DOJ, it was representing the United States, which is an amazing privilege, but for individual cases. Mm -hmm. And I moved from individual cases to large scale national policy and to having that impact at such a broad scale where you could see your ideas impact so many people for good was an opportunity that just could not pass up. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be more impactful even than I imagined. Because one of the things I realized is that it, it's so few people in positions of authority mm. that are making these important decisions. Mm. And I really wanted to be a part of that. Mm. Fantastic. And Aaron, what is it that, that drew you? I'm sure part of it was President Ronald Reagan himself, was. who was such an influence on so many of us. Um, so uh, in addition to that, what, what made you think, well, I should go work for the president? So I... I had an opportunity um, to go and do that when I was in school, mm -hmm. and then I'd heard the uh, second inaugural address that the president mm -hmm. did. Um, I was just bundled up with a few friends, and we went down to the mall and stood there and, and listened to the speech, and it was so inspiring. And mm -hmm. so I got involved, just volunteer work, and um, mm -hmm. then got a real job in the Library and Research Center, and it just, being part of that administration was just incredible. And 
you know, it's, I mentioned to you earlier, just getting coffee or Xeroxing or doing anything you needed to do to be part of a team because there's one leader, one principal, and that's the President of the United States and everybody else is a support. And just to be part of that administration and all the administrations, as a matter of fact, has been incredible. Yeah, that's great. So there's a, a mix of really a lot of admiration for the person who's running and certainly support of their policy agenda that all kind of comes into uh, to the motivation. And Roger, you mentioned impact, and I wanted to drill down just a little bit on that. Um, what kind of impact were you able to have or should people expect to be able to have maybe at, at multiple different levels? In my particular role, I was a regulator and enforcer hmm. of our civil rights laws, conscience and religious freedom laws, and health and privacy laws as well. That is unique. Not everybody has that role. However, most federal agencies do have a regulatory function. They issue regulations and in many ways, unfortunately, that's how we are governed nowadays. Not so much through our laws, but through our regulations. And there's tremendous power if you work in a federal agency and you work in a regulatory role. There are other folks who work in an enforcement role, enforcing the laws, and there's others who work in actual distribution of uh, federal benefits or federal programs or research and things like that. So there's all sorts of places for people to mm -hmm. contribute, but I do think it, people should be quite aware of the impact of our regulations on daily life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so important. And uh, Aaron, so you start off very, very young, um, and you were talking about being willing to help in any way that you can. Um, how does uh, your expectation of the impact you're going to be able to have, how does that change with time and, and with experience? Sure. So my last role was at the National Security Council, and mm -hmm. um, that's a very different role than obviously you start out with. And I, I came in and out of government, um, obviously. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it, the National Security Council is very much of a policy process. So mm -hmm. it's different than being part of the uh, agencies. It's really mm -hmm. more, if you didn't have a National Security Council running this type of process, so the policies are made. I mean, the president mm -hmm. drives the policy, but there's a whole system and process that's in place in order to follow that. And I mm -hmm. think that that is something that that level of discipline that people have to have mm -hmm. is very important. And um, because what is presented by the National Security Council to the president is where he has his options and can make a decision. And um, so that's quite critical. It is. And, you know, I, I think back on my own service and uh, the, you're never quite sure what your impact is. Um, but uh, on a day to day basis, one of the jobs I had was staff secretary. And so I had the job for Vice President Cheney that he actually did for President Ford. And uh, I knew that within my scope of control was making sure that all the briefings that he got were completely uh, factually correct and had all of the relevant information, perhaps multiple points of view fairly presented. And, uh, you know, you had the the satisfaction of knowing that you've given the principal the very best information. Um, could I, could yeah. I add two Jump in, stories of impact? <clears throat> During COVID, uh, so much of the federal government was in the beginning in almost a mode of panic. Mm -hmm. And being there during that moment, it, those who kept a level head made a tremendous difference. Mm -hmm. There were a couple instances <clears throat> where civil rights laws were being threatened, particularly with the question of rationing of medical care. There was a, the idea that we're going to run out of ventilators. What are we going to do? Mm -hmm. Who's going to be choose to live or to die? Those questions. And again, it was a, a very scary time in our history. Some states had triage policies that would put people with disabilities, particularly Down syndrome, at the back of the line and make them flatly ineligible. Mm -hmm. And the civil rights office that I had, I, I led at the time, became active on the issue and through our enforcement powers convinced states to drop those discriminatory mm -hmm. policies. Right? Mm -hmm. So that had real world impact uh, at a very scary time. And uh, another example was same thing during COVID. After the lockdowns, people were not going back to hospitals. Beds were trying to be reserved for the mm -hmm. most sick. And people were not receiving medical care. There was a question as to whether they could use their iPhones or use Skype, mm -hmm. et cetera, to get telehealth. Mm -hmm because those devices were not HIPAA compliant. My office was the, mm -hmm. the HIPAA regulator. Well, we issued guidance saying that we would not be enforcing it in that manner. Mm -hmm. And I believe we actually saved lives mm -hmm. and helped transform tele telemedicine because so many thousands of people were talking to their doctors when they otherwise were afraid to go to the, to the medical centers and hospitals. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we probably found 
people who were showing their doctors with their iPhone, hey, what is this uh, mole? And it turns out it may have been cancer. It goes to show you'll never know where your public service may take you, but you could even have life-saving impact. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I was thinking about this in my own experience, which is particularly as a more junior level person or when you start out, you have to do your work really excellently. And then before you know it, someone turns to you and asks for your opinion on something. And that's when you can have, have an impact. And so, it just you know, as in life, we should make sure that we're doing the very best job we can. And uh, sometimes they'll turn to you and say, well, what do you think, Roger? Or what do you think, Karen? So you worked for Vice President Cheney. Did the Vice President ever turn to you? He did, yes. And uh, he also taught me, he used to say this a lot. He'd say, I got this job because I didn't talk about the last job. So I probably shouldn't share everything. But uh, I will share that there, were, there was a process for Presidential Medal of Freedom winners. And uh, I got the first draft of the memo of everybody that I thought should, should win the award. And he ended up taking some of those suggestions straight to the president. So, um, you know, you, you never know. Uh, when someone turns to you ask for your advice, they might actually listen too. Uh, Aaron, um, I'd love to turn to you and talk to, and ask you that same question. On the impact, I was just going to say, um, you know, the religious freedom thing. It came to us. The president's going to speak at, you know, every year at the uh, UN. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of focus on religious freedom, and I thought it'd be wonderful if the president could speak at the UN. No president mm -hmm. has ever done that on religious freedom. And at the same time, from both the domestic side and the international side, we were looking at this issue, and we all came together, and domestic policy and the NSC, and really drove a religious freedom. Um, the president signed an EO, and then went up and had heads of state. Uh, first time ever that a president has spoken on that issue, so it was really quite something very okay. exciting. That's fantastic. And uh, so much of what the president does is leadership, and, and that is a huge step in leadership. Uh, let me ask you both, because uh, we'll probably have a lot of young people listening here, and they're wondering, uh, you both were senior folks in the administration, what kind of people were you looking to hire? What were the top two or three uh, things that you wanted to make sure were on target? Aaron, I'll start with you. Sure, great. Uh, one of the things we were looking at is uh, people that, A, had experience to go into the, to the different roles that they had in each of the department. I mean, Every single department that we have has multiple layers of roles, everything from strategic communications to advance to, uh, in the national security side, uh, all, a whole number of things on domestic policy side, the same thing. So we're looking for people that have had academic or real world experience um, in those areas. And then we look for someone that is supportive of the president's policies. They really have to be totally in line um, with the conservative policies that the president has, has uh, enunciated through the campaign and then obviously through the administration. So that's, that's the most important issue and drive interest in supporting and being a team player. Yeah. And you've really got to have like, all three of those to Absolutely. be effective. Uh, Roger, anything yeah. you'd add to that in terms of you know, the folks that are listening to this? Like, How could I make myself more appealing to a mid or senior level person? You have to be willing to be flexible and willing to sacrifice. Uh, a lot of people who come to these positions when they're young, they're full of energy, full of ideas, and they, they have to combine that with a work ethic that's willing to uh, take what comes because these jobs are very fast paced, they're very intense, but they are so incredibly rewarding. They are an adventure. When I would be interviewing folks to work under me, they would, I'd get the typical questions. What's, what's a day going to be like in this role? And I would my best to explain it and then I would tell them but you know a month from now it's going to be radically different yeah because things are changing so fast and people have to be comfortable with that mm -hmm. but I did tell them this I said I can't tell you what's going to happen two months from now but I could guarantee you you'll be telling your grandkids what you have done after you've served in in the administration yeah so well said and Aaron, I, I, since you got such an early start in your career, what are the kind of positions that somebody, even in college still, or right. maybe just recently graduated, it's their first job, what kind of positions are there available in the, you know, in the administration at large for that type of person? There are so many. I mean, I think timing is everything in terms of your ability to, to come into an administration. And even if you're still in college, you can find ways of trying to volunteer if you can. 
um, in different areas in different departments. Sometimes they, they take volunteers. Um, they certainly had at the White House. And I think once you graduate from college, if you can get in when a president, if you graduate when a president comes in or even a couple of years later, the first term or second term, there are jobs in, in policy, in scheduling, in advance, in strategic communications, mm -hmm. and in, in targeted areas where you might have had an opportunity to graduate from. So, If you work for an agency, then you're going to get a ton of expertise in a particular subject matter. Mm -hmm. So it could be FDA, it could be HUD, it could be housing policy, medicine, and that credential can go a long way because you'll have that expertise that other people will not. The positions, as I mentioned, are intense, and you're going to be exposed to a tremendous array of subject matters. But if you're in a particular agency, you'll be ahead of your peers when it comes to getting jobs in that industry. There is a revolving door between government and industry, for good or for ill. And if you have that government experience, you get a whole lot of credibility right off the bat. Yeah, and I'd, I'd point to one. I'm interested to get your reaction to this. Uh, we had great success in our office, in the Office of Vice President, uh, hiring for folks that had taken entry-level jobs as confidential assistants. Mm -hmm. So uh, we hired two confidential assistants to the director of the Peace Corps, of all things. Uh, and so um, because a confidential assistant is somebody that's got that dedication, that drive, uh, normally they've got that commitment, that excitement, and they're having to make a lot of personal sacrifices, because particularly in that particular mm -hmm. case, they're all over the world traveling, and that's the person that's right by the side of the director uh, who's helping with everything from logistics to policy and everything else. That's a really good training ground, and it's also one where there's a premium on willing to sacrifice and having uh, the kind of personality that would, would um, keep things in confidence and so forth. That's a really good uh, training ground, and then you can go from there. You've shown that you're loyal and that you work hard and that you think on your feet and you can deal with a principal and all the people they're dealing with. So I would just put a plug in there for confidential assistance. That's a really good point. I actually, um, Derek had hired someone right out of college who I had met a couple times and um, brought her in. And of course she had had this big degree and everything, um, but she came in and was, it was just that. And she just grew and went to the different places that I went uh, to and brought her along. And everything, as I said, from Xeroxing to practically going in and outside the Oval Office. And so yeah. you just never know. The key is to be open mm -hmm. and be flexible. As we had talked about, every door often opens that you never even expect. Yeah, I think that's really spot on. And hopefully you land with somebody like Aaron or Roger, uh, who's just really fantastic to work for. Because I know speaking for me, hiring those younger people and then helping them uh, mentoring them, helping them find the next job as well is just one of the most rewarding things about public service. It there's, is. I, I would just say there's no job too small serving in the administration. And Go when, in and with both feet and you're going to find great reward. And once you serve in one administration, you're credentialed to serve in another one, yeah. right? That, that's one thing. There was an eight-year gap between Trump and the previous Republican administration, and we noticed that there was that gap in experience. Mm. So we really valued people who had the knowledge when they were there in the Bush years because they knew how the place ran. And you can't uh, underestimate how you could position yourself not only for working in industry, but going back into government later in your career. Yeah, really well said. And so uh, let me turn to lessons learned because I'm sure there's things you know now that you probably wished you knew, uh, Aaron, back when you were in grade school and started your first administration. Um, or uh, maybe in between your, your jobs, like going to the NSC, that's a new thing. Like, there were there things that you learned there? I'm sure there were. But maybe one or two lessons learned, I'll start with you, Aaron, of uh, things you wish you knew before you had started. I think really the, what I learned is, as Roger said, you don't know how flexible that you actually have to be. Yeah. Um, even though you might say, oh, I can be here 18 hours a day, and oftentimes you are or more. Um, just the pivoting from issue to issue, it's like going from lily pad to lily pad, and you've just got to be on it. So if you, anything, you can have anything thrown at you, and I think that the flexibility is something that's really important. Um, and also energy and optimism, because some days 
things just fall apart at the seams and you don't think you think it's your fault or you think it, the thing is always keep thinking that you're just rowing the boat rowing the boat with everybody else and I think optimism is key and that goes back to leadership and leadership in every group you don't have to be sitting at the White House um, to feel like you're making an impact because you're making an impact every place you are you're part of an administration and part of a conservative movement yeah, that's really great. And your lily pad analogy is a really good one. And uh, another thing I think that is good going in is to really build that network of people that have a broad array of experience and knowledge that you can call on when you're there. It's like, I, I don't, I've been presented with this issue. I don't, out of my comfort zone, but I bet I, I know two or three people I can call. Uh, probably a lot of them work here at Heritage, uh, <laughs> wink, wink, uh, or one of our 45 uh, partner organizations. That's right. Uh, and so building that network before you go in is also critical. And you do all along. Um, as Roger mentioned, coming in and going out, like I personally have and, and many people have, um, the people that I met at the beginning in the first administration, the second, the third, and, and the fourth, mm -hmm. those are all people that you're going to know, mm -hmm. even if you come um, from across the United States, which we really hope so many people do. Yes. It's not just a Washington inside the Beltway game. That's not what we're looking for. The next administration really wants people from across the United States. So even if you come for a couple of years and serve or in the second part of an administration, mm -hmm. it, everybody's welcome. And I think that's the, the things that you're bringing from the states is, is critical. And, and the network is so important. Yeah. So you, you have to be part of the conservative movement mm -hmm. as a known quantity to a decision maker who will be able to hire you. Mm -hmm. And that's why this project is so yeah. important. We're trying to connect as many people to give them the tools so that they will be part of the network. So when the time comes, we will know that person is a known quantity. They're good, they're eager, they're qualified. Mm -hmm. Let's bring them in to serve. Because one of the things you realize once you're in the administration is that time is your most precious commodity. You never have enough of it you know you have four years and or eight years at best, which may sound like a lot, but we had four years. And we were counting the days, and towards the end, it was so many things we thought, wow, if we only had more time. And that's one of the lessons is when you go in, prepare to, to work as fast as possible uh, because the country's at stake, yeah. and you only have a set amount of time. So use every day wisely. And once you're there, be willing to adapt to the circumstances. If I could walk through the policy process. Yeah, so from idea to, to reality. I also served on transition where many of the, uh, uh, it was all on a table. The, the world was an, an open, uh, open vista and it was exciting. Then once we got the ideas in the form of executive orders, the president sets the agenda and public servants are there to execute the president's agenda, particularly political appointees. OMB and the White House Domestic Policy Council have an outsized role in coordinating and making sure the president's initiatives are advanced mm -hmm. and the agencies implement, and there's a feedback. The agencies give their ideas back to the Domestic Policy Council, in, in my circumstance, uh, and OMB. Once those ideas are fleshed out, it's usually done through policy implementation with either guidance or, more importantly, regulations. And that could be a two-year process. Mm -hmm. Drafting the regulations, getting the public comments in, responding to the public comments, making sure they're legally sufficient and adequate, and then you litigate them. Mm -hmm. Because if it's anything of, of real impact, there's gonna be some divisions and uh, we're a very litigious society, it's gonna be lawsuits. So you have to plan. Can you get all this done mm -hmm. from idea to order to regulation, to litigation, perhaps up to the Supreme Court, as we did with the contraceptive uh, mm -hmm. mandate. We actually got the regulation and idea and helped the Little Sisters of the Poor and other religious groups mm -hmm. not violate their conscience, and the Supreme Court decided it within four years. Mm -hmm. We didn't get all of that within four years, and that's one of the biggest lessons of how important you had to plan it all out from the beginning. Yeah, Roger, that's so well said, and that's so why we're so excited about Project 2025 to try to do as much of that thinking in advance so you can hit the ground running. I wanted to talk a little bit about timing issues because you just mentioned that it can take a really long time to get all the way through that Python of policy process. 
Can you talk about the importance of hitting the ground running a little bit, both uh, the White House and also in agencies? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you hear a lot about the first hundred days or so. How would you uh, categorize that uh, timing? It's key. Challenge? Every president has a honeymoon honeymoon period, right after the inauguration. The country's excited. It's uh, either a new person or it's a re-election, but we just got through an election, which is al already tough. The president has so much running room in those first 100 days. You have to have an administration that knows exactly how to take the reins of power, uh, if they're changing parties in particular, and implementing right off the bat. You don't have that honeymoon period for very long. Yeah. Maybe 100 days. Uh, the American people will give you the chance to perform, and you have to execute and prove that you deserve to win that election by fulfilling the promises to the American people. So. That's the most frenetic uh, time. Also, at the end is also quite frenetic because you want to get as much as you as you can get in as possible, uh, which means you have to be ready. Everything has to be done at the front end as much as possible, and that requires having the right people in there. Hopefully, people who have been there before. Uh, in my experience, it was a learning curve, and that took time. Right, and again, we had an eight-year gap before we switched parties in the White House, and uh, it took some some time to get up to speed on some things but we were able to work hard and get it done. And next time around, we're gonna be even more prepared and I'm excited to see what's in store. And Aaron, I wanna hear from you in a minute, but I would just say to continue to watch and learn on these training videos, it'll really equip you, whatever agency you're going into or a White House office, to know what to expect that first day. And knowing what to expect is really half the battle or more than half the battle. Uh, and then doing that thinking in advance uh, which the the policy proposals in 20 project 2025 will do so we're we're i think we get the recipe right uh now we just have to execute on the on the cooking but aaron what would you say about uh timing considerations and how important is it to get that running start uh, for folks that are going to be going right into an agency for example? absolutely first of all i think this project 2025 is unprecedented uh, usually it's the transition period where people start putting these things together and to have something like this ready to roll um, for someone that comes in is just fantastic. So if you have the opportunity to obviously read all the uh, policies that have already been recommendations um, mm -hmm. that have been vetted, I think that's really important. On day one, the first thing you're going to be doing is going into your to your office and working with your manager, supervisor, mm -hmm. and your team. And I think you will already sit down and discuss what's going to happen, and you've really got to get going. And I, it, just as Roger said, you have no every hour counts and you never know after the first hundred days obviously you're projecting beyond that because you have this full agenda that's been laid out but then there's always things that could happen i mean yeah. if we look at president bush at, at all of this no one knew that 9 11 was going to happen no one knew that COVID was going to happen i mean there are sidewinders that come yeah. and you just don't know but you want to stay and make sure that you can get these things done that especially on the first hundred days that's critical yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent point. And uh, Aaron, you mentioned earlier about uh, we hope the next um, conservative administration draws from people from all over, not just from Washington. Uh, and that's an adjustment for a lot of people who are out there. So uh, for the person who's, who's watching this uh, from somewhere out in the heartland, uh, maybe they're not even in the policy world, maybe they're a small business person or a lawyer, an accountant, a uh, plumber, whoever it might be that's thinking about what could I add to this, uh, what would be your advice to them? My advice to them would be to always feel confident that if you have the same, if you're aligned with the president and the conservative movement, everybody is welcome because you have something to add. All skills are, are welcome here in Washington and, and don't be afraid to come to Washington because it, certainly the conservative movement has a lot more respect for the people outside who bring something, and, and, and that's America, and that's federalism. And so what you can bring to Washington is gonna have a whole lot of impact, so we welcome you. Yeah, that's well said, and I think even of the director of Project 2025, Paul Dance, who was a, a lawyer in New that's York right. City, and he was inspired by uh, President Trump and mm -hmm. whose administration he served, and he stepped out of that world and into the personnel world and uh, I, I think he'll, uh, he'll tell you that he's glad that he did, and I know the president is glad that he did uh, for the service that he rendered. And really, the, 
as you said, the experiences and the outlook that you bring from outside of Washington is so critically important to making the things work. I'll know just one note with President George uh, W. Bush, uh, along with all of the wonderful people he brought came uh, fantastic Tex-Mex, uh, which we really <laughs> had a right. dearth of uh, mm -hmm. here. But uh, just culturally, this town, town changes with That's new exactly administrations. Right. And so uh, come here, um, breathe some, some new air, some new life into, our, uh, into this capital city, I think is just so important and so healthy. Roger, anything you'd add on folks who are they're yeah. in a different career track? Uh, is it possible to pause and to go in and serve in government service? And uh, what advice would you have? Yeah, if you have a mindset of being a change agent, mm -hmm. that is incredibly attractive for people who are hiring in political positions. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to say, I'm going to you know, take my high paying job and put it on pause, or uh, maybe I'm gonna delay some other life goal I had in order to serve at this moment now to make a difference. And there are so many obstacles. You could have a recalcitrant uh, career uh, uh, employees in an agency that are trying to impede the president's priorities if they disagree. You could have infighting among political appointees as well. So you have to have a thick skin but you have to have that guiding star of, I want to come serve to help the country and implement the president's policies. And if you have that drive, you're gonna be okay. And one other thing I would add on the personnel side, I saw good people who had that sort of drive taken out of consideration because they said some irresponsible things on social media. Mm -hmm. And that's a very important thing to be aware of, that you will be vetted uh, on, on your history of social media use, for the good and the bad, if you've shown courage and grit and stood up for the right conservative principles, that will be a plus factor. Mm -hmm. If you've done it in a way that is reckless, that may be a negative factor. Mm -hmm. So be very sensitive to what you do in social media. That's a really good tip. And mm -hmm. I'd say too that President Reagan had a sign on his desk that really everybody should have when they're serving an administration, which is there is no limit to what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. And I think that's so true, mm -hmm. um, that when you're having success, spreading around uh, the, um, the accolades is really, really important. And just remember, it's not about you. It's about uh, the president and the country, ultimately. And I think that's one of the, the, the things I think we should end on, is uh, you both are now here full-time at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, your, your work is to try to help save this country. Uh, our president likes to remind all of us that there really is kind of a narrow window here we have to turn things around. So can you speak, maybe Roger, I'll start with you, can you speak to the urgency of this moment and uh, why, even if it's hard for people to understand how this might fit in their career, why it's just so important mm -hmm. that people do step forward and serve at this time? In short, the country is at stake. The, the, the winds of cultural change have been going in the progressive liberal side for decades. And the only way to stop it is getting back the reins of power at the federal government. The, the liberal behemoth has uh, used the federal government to pursue its aims with a vengeance, and that's where the main fight is. And we need folks of great, solid conservative principles of integrity to step up and serve to take the country back. Yeah, well said. Erin, anything you'd add to that? Just um, on the international side, I, I think it's from national security side, we've never had a greater threat than we do now, um, which is China, and I think that we need to recognize that. I had an opportunity to live there with the last firm that I was with, mm -hmm. and I think it's very clear ideologically uh, what our differences are, and it just integrates. It's not foreign policy versus domestic policy. It's all one now, and I think that we need to see what's happened here in the United States, and as, as Roger said, move forward on a conservative track, because it's all it's very clear what the next steps have to be. Well said, and, and I think I just end by saying, uh, if you are a person of good character, uh, solid conservative, if you decide you can't join this project, then think about there's someone else that is going to do that. We'd rather it be you. Thank you for watching this session. We hope you'll watch all the sessions to be as prepared as possible if the American people do give us a conservative president. Thanks very much for listening.